Okay. Now, on the day that we release the abstract for this breakout session, which, as you know, said jokingly, we're going to introduce wearables that we hope will blow your socks off. We mean this more literally than you might think. That day, the ATAP chatter on Reddit went something like this. Smart socks confirmed. <laughs> What? Is there a self-destruct feature? It just displays how smelly your feet are on your watch. <laughs> Now, we've been talking about wearables for two decades, maybe longer. And whenever I've seen a field where many smart people have worked for a long time and we've struggled for big breakthroughs, it's been because there's some underlying scientific principle that we're missing. And if we can find it, it might unlock new strategies or opportunities. We asked this question about wearables, and here's what we discovered. A work from Paul Fitz. It was entitled The Information Capacity of the Human Motor System. It was written in June of 1954. That was six years after Shannon's seminal work on information theory. And many people were beginning to use information theory to explain things that they hadn't understood before. Now, Fitz used these basic concepts from Shannon's theory to demonstrate that our brains and bodies combine to create an information system with a certain capacity. Now, there were controversies about Fitz's work and nuances to it, but that science taught us something interesting about wearables. Let's look. If we look across the x-axis as screen size, this is tablets, smaller smartphones, against the y-axis, this is the load on the human motor cortex system, measured in bits per second. And if we look at the dependency between these two things for the human body, this is what we discover. Now, how did Fitz measure this? What he did is he took two bars, a certain thickness and a certain distance apart, and he asked his subjects to tap between those two bars. Now, while they're thick and far apart, this tapping task is easy. And when they're thin and close together, this tapping task is hard. And that's what's represented by this red line. Now, if we look at the limit that is imposed by the system that goes from my shoulder to the tip of my finger, which is the system that I use to interact with most consumer electronics de devices, what I find is that it intersects the line, this red line, in an interesting place. Now, Ivan Pupirev, he also revisited this and discovered something similar. Now, what does this tell us? Right at that intersection, we find the screen size of a smartwatch. So what we learn from that is that as the screen size shrinks to the point where we can put it on our body, we are approaching the limit of our ability to interact with it. Now, we have two projects that Yvonne will talk about today. Project Soli, which seeks to break this tension by increasing the bandwidth of the system that we use to interact, and Project Jacquard, which seeks to create a larger surface area in which we can interact. Now, Yvonne has been working on these technologies, ones that blend digital and physical interactivity for a good portion of his career. And there are efforts to ease the interaction burden through voice and gesture, but Ivan is going to so show you something very different. Two projects, Project Soli and Project Jacquard, which seek to break this fundamental tension. Ivan. Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk about Project Soli. Our hand is an amazing instrument. It's very fast and precise, particularly when we're using tools that require full dexterity of our fingers. The sensitivity and accuracy is very, very natural to us. We use it every day. We don't even notice it. But we're still not able to capture this sensitivity in our user interfaces, which are still quite clunky. There are many reasons why fingers and using fingers for manipulation is superior. 
For example, if you measure the bandwidth from the cortex to the tip of your fingers, it's 20 times the bandwidth to the, um, to the elbow. So what if we can capture this power of, of fingers, this powerful capabilities of hand and fingers, and use for user interaction? What kind of interfaces can we build for wearables or other devices? And I've been asking these questions for a long time. Now, one approach is to give everybody a tool. Give everybody a pen and go with that. Not scalable. What we propose instead is that to use your hand motion vocabulary, a familiar hand motions you already learn from tools you're using every day for the interaction. For example, we all learn this motion, right? We're using a mobile phone all the time. We, uh, we, we're manipulating this every day. And we don't have to learn it again. It's very intuitive. What if we remove the mobile phone and only leave the motion, which you already know, and then this motion, decoupled from the physical device, decoupled from the mobile phone, can be used to control other devices and becomes more generic, more generic input device, input uh, modality for everything else. It doesn't have to be only virtual touchpad. There's a multiple motions. There's a broad vocabulary of motions which can be created by your hand. Your hand can become a variety of controls, such as virtual dial, a slider, or anything else. So note, note how haptic feedback came naturally, because your hand provides you haptic feedback while you're using it. So these are very powerful physical metaphors, which we're already aware of. And they can form interaction vocabulary. They can be applied to multiple contexts of use for multiple devices. For example, you can use you know, your virtual touchpad to control the map on the, on the watch, or you can control, make a virtual dial to control your radio and volume of radio cars go through stations. Multiple things you can do. So what you propose is your hand can be complete, self-contained interface control. Always with you, intuitive, easy to use, and very, very ergonomic. <laughs> In fact, it can be the only interface control and only interface device that you, were, that you would ever need for wearables. All physical controls replaced by your hand. Now, to accomplish that, we need a sensor. And not every sensor would work. But we need a sensor that can capture sub-millimeter motions of your fingers that are overlapped in 3D space. Because we want to put it into the small devices, such as wearables, it has to walk through materials, it has to go through materials, work day and night, and be small enough to fit into the device. So we also don't want to instrument the user. We don't want to put things in your hand. So we have to go, so we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum like the entire one, and still we couldn't find anything appropriate. You know, capacitive sensing is very nice, but it cannot track 3D. Cameras would struggle with overlapped fingers. However, in between these two extremes, there is a sense which is almost perfect, would fit all our requirement, and that's radar. The radar can do almost all of that. All of the things I talked about, fast, precise, can work through materials, all of that, except for one thing, it doesn't fit in the watch. <laughs> and I have to make it smaller, otherwise it's not going to be wearable. So, um, and that, that's kind of hard. So we didn't have to start with a dish, thankfully. With, this is our first prototype with about this size on the table. And then over the course of time, we worked with our partners and industrial collaborators to go through many prototypes like that. And today we have our first gesture radar that is small enough to fit into the wearable. Here it is. A radar in the pocket. <laughs> so this is a new category of interaction sensors running at 60 gigahertz that can capture the motion of your fingers and hand in free space, touchless, at resolutions and speed not possible before. And you don't have to be a ref engineer to use it. Everything you need is inside, antennas, control electronics, and we can make it at scale. 
Uh, when we connect to a computer, we can run it at, freaking, at, at f speeds up to 10,000 frames per second. And because we are fast and furious here as an ATAP, as Rigida mentioned, we went from the first prototype to this chip I just showed you in 10 months. <laughs> So um, it's not only hardware that matters. The real essence of the radar, the reasons of it, is in the signal. So originally we think about the radar as something like an echo. You know, you, you know, you send a signal, it bounces back from the object, come give you a single return. However, to, couple, to capture the complexity of the hand the motion, the close range, what you would have to do, you would have to have the narrow beams scanning the entire hand in, 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 in real time, which is really expensive, both in hardware-wise and computationally. We cannot do wearable radar this way. Instead, what we do, we illuminate the entire hand with a broad beam and treat the received signal as a complex superposition of reflections from different parts of your hand as it changes and moves in space. And as the hand moves, you can see that the shape of the signal changes. So we track changes in the signal, then change of the signal, and estimate shape of the hand from, from the signal changes. And now to explain how it works, I would like to invite on the stage Jamie Lean, our lead research engineer and radar expert. Thank you, Ivan. The radar signal contains a lot of complexity and information about my hand when it's in the field of view. So we have a short demonstration showing how we interpret and extract this information for gesture sensing. Let's start with the raw radar signal shown in this plot here. This one signal actually contains a lot of information about my hand's size, shape, pose, and dynamics. You can see how responsive it is to any slight motion. So how do we capture all of this information? We first transform the signal into various representations which help us to visualize and understand the radio wave's response to my hand. For example, on the left, in the range Doppler image, the specular reflections off of my hand are mapped according to velocity and distance. If I move my hand up and down over the sensor, you can see this little ball of energy tracking my motion very finely. And if I start wiggling two fingers, suddenly we can resolve two moving components instead of just one. Similarly, we have other transformations which help us to interpret immediate changes in the signal phase and amplitude, as well as frequency-dependent electromagnetic phenomena, which depend on my, on my hand's size and pose. From these signal representations, we can extract features which directly measure my hand's characteristics and dynamics. These features are fed into machine learning algorithms, which interpret them into gesture labels. And now, the sensor can tell if I'm wiggling my fingers or holding still. So you can see at each stage of this pipeline, we abstract more and more from the original radar signal as we extract more and more concrete information about the gesture that I'm performing. And we'll be making this entire pipeline available to developers in the API that we're building. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. So this is the world's first radio frequency sensor used for, uh, for touch and gesture interactions. So we talked about all these small, tiny gestures. Let me try to show you another demo where we actually try to do this. This is very early work. It just off the, like we just finished a week ago, I guess so. <laughs> so um, first of all, there's the detection of the hand, right? So we, we, the radar can detect presence, can lock in your hand or lock out from your hand, can lock, your, uh, lock on the hand. And I'm, I'm trying to do is to control, directly map motion of the, of the, of the hand See how precise it is. This is direct mapping, where I map one to one. So even tiny motions like this produce exact large motions on the screen. So I can control this little blob really, really precisely, with just tiny motions of my fingers. Now, 
Now, this was an interpreted motion of my hand, right? Direct mapping from the uh, motion of the fingers to the control of the screen. So now we do some simple interpretations, which allows you to do things, control the gestures. I can do really, really fast. So this is some, some of the machine learning and intelligence we can build in the user interfaces. What's exciting about the radar is we have multiple modalities. I can, I can track gestures and, 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 and distance. So the next demo, I can create, I can create multiple controls that separated in space. But in this case, I can control our, what time it is? I think about nine or something, no? OK, 10, eight? OK. And uh, here, we can control minutes. And I can go back to hours and control hours again. And I can control minutes again. Uh, I can do the whole day. <laughs> now, let's not forget this is not just a micro, micro sensor and micro gesture sensor, right? It can do a lot of things. Um, it can be a na natural gesture sensor. For, we, made, we made a small game, a soccer game, where I can pe uh, pu push the ball. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I actually re I rigged this game so I always win. I can't lose in this game. Um, so back to, the, uh, back to the project. So in Project Soleil, our what is became what is. We built a sensor that is small enough to fit into the wearables, a new sensor to be able to fit on the wearables, but powerful enough to capture the exquisite manipulation capabilities of your hand. It's very powerful, a new sensor modality. We're working on the finalizing developing of the brand of the board and software API that we're applying to release to developers later this year so that you too can begin experiment and play with this new sensor modality and create new amazing things. Yeah. So let's, let's move to another project. As you remember from the, from the uh, earlier slide with the beginner showed with the graph, there are two directions. One to increase the capability of the sensors through the uh, of, the, of the interfaces through using faster and better manipulations and interactions using our hand. And the second one, to increase the space where we can interact. So let's talk about Project Jacquard, which approaches this problem. So Project Jacquard is about textiles. The idea from the project comes from observing similarity between multi-touch panels, which we use on mobile phones, and textiles. Both are interlocking grids. Therefore, if you can replace some of the yarns on textile with conductive yarns, what we can do is to weave multi-touch textile sensors. We can weave multi-touch panels, weave them, that are as flexible, colorful, tactile, made of silk, wool, cotton, any other materials, like any other textile. You can weave interactive input devices. And if we make garment out of such textiles, it would be immediately interactive and responsive, and you would not call it a wearable. You would call it a jacket. <laughs> so we have seen instances of interactive garments before. People have done this. But we want to move beyond novelty. We want to move beyond a single case use cases. We want to make interactive garments at scale, so everybody can make them and everybody can buy them. And when we go this direction, we have to think about multiple clothes. We have to think about different clothes from multiple brands. So we have to think about making interactive textiles at the scale of the global apparel fashion industry, which sells 19 billion garments a year, which is 150 times more than mobile phones. We cannot expect global fashion industry to change just for us, even though we're Google. <laughs> we have to make interactive garments possible using existing manufacturing techniques and existing manufacturing supply chains. We have to adapt to textile industry so every textile mill in the world can weave interactive textiles. So can we really manufacture interactive textiles, interactive garments for this reason, at scale? So that's the question. We travel the world. We went to multiple countries, Japan, Europe. We learned about industry. We made friends. This is one of the, our partner mills in Japan. It turned out that the very basic fundamental technologies and materials that are required to manufacture interactive textiles simply are not available. You cannot buy them off the shelf. So we had to invent them as we were building the capability. Starting with the conductive yarns. Conductive yarns that can withstand harsh industrial processes of textile manufacturing would involve burning textiles with open fire. 
stretching, washing them, and pulling them with metal clothes. I saw it myself. This is not very friendly to electronics. <laughs> so another problem was the choice, a choice of colors of materials. This is an example of a catalog of yarn swatches which, which textile designers use, use when they make fabrics. This is the choice of conductive yarns. <laughs> Comes in one color, gray. <laughs> And it's not even that conductive. So we had to go and to invent our own yarns, which you see in this picture. Not only are they are hundreds of times more conductive, they could withstand all the, all the burning and pulling forces of textile manufacturing, all those conditions, but they also look and feel completely normal to textile designer or to you. They look indistinguishable from normal yarns. However, if you look at them at the microscope, you will see that in fact they are complex multi-layer structures where highly conductive metallic alloys are braided together with thin silk fibers to give this yarn supreme strength and durability. And at the same time, we can make it in multiple colors. So let me show a video how this textile, how these yarns are made. So you can see from the center, you can see the conductive core comes in and it's braided around with a sleeve of additional, additional yarns which gives it strength but also can be of any color. It's a heavy industrial process. This is a very different experience from programming. <laughs> this is multiple cars which we can produce with our manufacturing approaches. Now, a challenge of producing interactive textiles is also about connecting them to the digital world. It's not just to make textile and be happy about it, but you want to actually use it. So when we made the first textile, we were very naive, and we just made this whole thing interactive, all 20 meters of it. But that created a connectivity problem. How would you take this textile and connect it to electronics? So we tried the brute force. <laughs> More brute force. A little bit less brute force, but still didn't work because I have to pull out each of the yarns by hand and it just doesn't work. So what we did, we went back to the original idea. We went back to the craft. I thought, how can you weave interactive textiles in a way so it's easy to connect to electronics, not the other way around. How does an electronic to attach to the textiles? So we went back to our partners in textile industry and figured out how we can weave our patches precisely where we want them to be to localize them, so the problem is localized in one place, not on 20 meters textile. On the back, we designed three-dimensional weaving techniques where we can change directions of the yarn, going from the top surface of the yarn to the bottom, and then free flow outside so that we can, can access them with tools and machines required to make connection. At the same time, we're able to keep the structure of textiles, the structure of the yarns, you know, in touch so that we can connect the yarns and connect order. So the order of correct connection is very important. So at the end, we get something like this. And that can be connected to electronics really easily and without any efforts. So let me show how interactive textiles is woven. There is a many, many moving parts. So this is one of our partners, one of the experts in textile manufacturing and textile design in Japan. One of the best ones. So you can see our, 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 uh, our yarn coming in, our conductive yarn. And you can see by weaving the interactive panel coming out. This is our yarns inside the woven textile. This is a woven panel coming in. And we can place it anywhere we want on a piece of textile, and we can do it with anything you like. So using this established process, we can weave interactive touch panels. They don't have to be gray. They can be any color, any shape. Contemporary designs, this interactivity woven there, classics, transparent, invisible, stretchable, and of course we can make it on any size. We can weave interactive panels as large as you want. And now we can connect the interactive textiles to the digital world. We can connect them and control our devices with that. So let me show a demo how it works. First of all, let me show the textile. This is a piece of textile you saw in the video. This is how it looks like. It's real. It's not, you know, there you go. Yeah, this is the back of the textile, you can see. We cut out the yarns to, 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 to separate them. And now I'll show how it works. Um, 
you can see the greed and as, and as I approach and you can see the black black square over here yeah here you go um, that is interactive area as I approach it in my hand you can see it moves So that's, you see, the difference between our work and the touch, touch panels. Again, it's, it's designed to sense your entire hand because we don't expect people to use the fingers when they track with the clothes like this. But you also can use fingers, of course. Here we go. So you can draw, you can write something. A. Uh, you can do, do multi-touch like this. Um, you can do the little waves across the textile like this. Oh, but different directions like this too, you know. <laughs> To you, wave to you, <laughs> wave out to you. Um, so the, we don't expect these textiles to be um, to be replacement of the touch screens. The, the material properties and the quality of textiles completely different, right? There's something you can put on your body or on your couch or on your pillow. On many places you use textile and then it becomes interactive, not by, by, by precise manipulations, but using broad gestures of your hand when you can just swipe across and control anything you would like to control. So what we're we doing right now, let's switch back to the slides. We are building the entire pipeline. We're going through the textiles from, from the yarns to textile structures to connectors, the wireless connectivity, mobile systems, and then to applications and services which you can control with the textiles. This is a website where you can follow our progress and please follow us and you know let us know what you think. Because what we're trying to build is build ecosystem where people can design applications for this technology and build new services based on soft computing, soft, flexible textile computing. Yeah. Now the story would not be complete. Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong clicker. Here you go. <laughs> so the story would not be complete if you actually try to build a garment. How do we know that we succeed? And the only way to know that, that you can succeed, is to actually make a garment, interactive garment, and we give it to a tailor to do it. Not yourself. Somebody else has to do it. So we went to <laughs> London Savile Row, which has a long, renowned history of bespoke suit tailoring. We went to tailor and gave him an interactive textile, raw interactive textiles, and asked to make a jacket. And that short movie will show the experience. Creating jackets is a 200 years old tradition. It's a craft and art. People learn from generation to generation. The tools and materials, they don't change as much as we used to in our digital world. It's all about feeling, how you cut it, how it feels on your hands. So we give them the new material, our interactive textile. They were really excited. Because rarely in this industry something new and completely different comes in. It's industry built on tradition and craft and respect for the craft and respect for traditions. The brands we're working with have been around for, a lot of the brands, clothes brands have been around for hundreds of years. This is a connecting, they design a little pouch to put electronics. The closing in. There's a jacket come to life. Swipe across the sleeve and make a phone call. <laughs> Your jacket has arrived. <laughs> and you can see this jacket right here, me wearing it. <laughs> I actually I actually quite like it. So it's about you know, combined technology and fashion and being, making things fashionable, beautiful, that's the answer. Now we think about jacquard as a raw material that will, be, which will make computation part of the language which apparel designers and textile designers and fashion industries speak. We want digital to be just the same thing as you know, quality of yarns, the color you use, how digital it is. And we cannot do it by ourselves. We have to, and we want it to work with creatives from the fashion industry. And today with us is our first partner, a historic brand, Sister San Francisco Company. It was here long before we arrived here. They came with a gold rush 
and build their company by designing functional and fashionable, highly innovative garments. Our partnership is continuation of that tradition, and that's Levi's. And I would like to introduce my colleague, Paul Dillinger, a head of global product innovation from Levi Strauss Company. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. This is, uh, this is really, really exciting. Uh, as a kid, when I decided to become a fashion designer at 12, uh, this is not the company I thought I would be keeping. I, I did not... <laughs> anticipate playing in this sandbox with these pirates. This is really, this is great. Uh, none of the future that we're experiencing right now was imaginable. This was science fiction uh, not too long ago. Um, this opportunity, this extraordinary pioneering spirit that ATAP um, embodies, it makes me think about our own history at Levi's. Um, Levi Strauss was a German immigrant uh, who decided to go west with the gold rush, like so many other people, to find his fortune in California. And, uh, and he was a dry goods purveyor, giving, selling the supplies to the miners going up into the gold fields near Sutter's, Sutter's Mill. And, uh, and the miners were wearing cotton pants, right? And they were falling apart. They were, they were ripping at these uh, stress points. And there was this point of innovation where Levi Strauss and his friend Jacob Davies discovered that if they could use a copper rivet to create a point of strength where there had been a point of weakness, that they could solve a real problem. And that's a, there's an interesting symmetry here. The use of a metal alloy, copper, and from an unexpected place, an unexpected technology, machine tools, creating strength in apparel. There's a nice symmetry of innovation between what's happening here at ATAP with Project Jacquard and, what's happening at, and what happened at Levi's uh, over nearly 150 years ago. And I think if Levi Strauss was here with us today looking for the next gold rush, there's a, there's a lot in common between Silicon Valley and Sutter's Mill. Uh, we think about the optimism, the creativity, the energy, the excitement around invention that these two uh, cultures share. And it's only appropriate that these two great global brands rooted in San Francisco come together for an exciting opportunity like this. Now, the question is why? You know, when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you think about the innovation, yes, the dazzling opportunity that we see in this new technology, yes, this great platform that's been enabled, yes, but why? And I would think about this, and all of us working on this project would think about why. I mean, I'd be driving to work in the morning thinking why, and some guy would cut me off because he's texting while driving. I would think about why as I'm biking around the city struggling to get my navigation function from my phone as, as I'm navigating this, this, the, 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 the grid of San Francisco. I'm sitting at dinner and I'm looking at someone else at a table sitting across from their partner and their phone buried, in their, buried in, up, up to their face. Phone to face, that's a why right there. We live in a beautiful, richly textured, real world, but ever increasing need and engagement with a digital world. And these worlds exist with a certain tension. If there's a chance to enable the clothes that we already love, to help us facilitate access to the best and most necessary of this digital world while maintaining eye contact with the person we're eating dinner with, right? Yeah. This is a real value. <laughs> it, it's, it's, if we can deliver that value in the, in the form of the clothes that you as friends and fans of this brand already love, that is a project worth doing. But as a fashion designer, it's not really a project that I'm entirely equipped to take on. We've got the genius pirates at ATAP who can help us develop and deliver this platform. And now we have all this great capability at Levi's. We've got experts in fabric creation and supply chain. We've got designers who can help us bring this form to life and the merchants who can package it up and bring it to the consumer in a really compelling way. But there's a third creative constituency that we must activate. And so now, my friends, you are all fashion designers along with us. Yeah. You, uh, you have the, we can, we can tailor a few specific op applications to, for, for the exact consumer that we know, but the real opportunity is a creative unlock in this community to activate this new platform in ways that we have not yet imagined. And it's gonna be iterative and it's gonna be fast and fun. And we're inviting you to come along on this journey with us as the fashion designers of the future to make something really special, ha special happen with Project Jacquard. All right? Yeah? yeah? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. And with us today is James Curley, or JC as we know him, president of the Levi's brand. JC.
when I spoke, when I spoke to JC this Wednesday, he told me that at Levi's they were focused on two things: driving their iconic brand and innovation. And last week, on the 142-year anniversary of the 501s, they found a 130-year-old pair of Levi's from the 1880s. That's iconic. And this week, we announce our partnership to work on new wearables. That's innovation. So, congrats, JC.